today on Touching Lives. Fifth Amendment. Remember what it says? No person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. That's, that's a constitutional right. And yet the Bible says spiritually there is no Fifth Amendment. You can't plead the Fifth with God. With hope and encouragement for life, this is Touching Lives with James Merritt. Here's what I want to ask you. Do you ever have times in your life when you try to find God and you try to see God, but He's totally out of focus? Or, or let me put it to you this way, because this is where I have been in my own life. Have you ever felt like your prayers were bouncing off the ceiling? Have you ever felt like you were talking, but God wasn't listening? Have you ever felt like that if God was anywhere around, He was at least a million miles, uh, miles away? And even though you may be a follower of Jesus Christ, would you be honest right now if, if this is true? Would you say that your relationship with God this morning at best would be rather distant? Would you look at your life today and say, you know, I have to be honest, there are times in my life I really have felt closer to God and been closer to God than I am right now. Now, that may be just a feeling or it may be a fact. As a matter of fact, you can be close to God, but not feel close to God. You can feel close to God, but not be close to God. And so the, 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 the bad news is, you may be very well distant from God. The good news is, you don't have to be. We're in a series that I have to be honest, is probably helping me more than it may even help some of you. We're calling it Up Close and Personal. I told you last week, the most staggering thought I've ever had about God is this thought. This God that spoke a world into existence. This God who can do anything. This God who said nothing is impossible for me. This God who has only one job on His description, and that's to run this universe and make sure it keeps going. This God wants to have an intimate, personal, up-close relationship 24-7 with you and with me. That God wants our relationship to be closer than any other relationship I have, closer than my relationship with my wife, closer than my relationship with my kids, closer than my relationship with my grandkids, closer than my relationship with our church, closer than my relationship with my friends. God so loves us, He wants our relationship with Him to be the number one relationship. Now, there's a word in the Bible for that relationship, and it's called fellowship. Now, here's how it works. Once you come to Jesus Christ and you trust Christ as your Lord and your Savior and you become a Christ follower, the Bible says you enter into a permanent relationship with God. It's unending. It's eternal. It can never be broken. However, fellowship with God, totally different. It can be interrupted and it can be hindered. In other words, there are times in your life you still have a relationship with God, but God's out of focus. You don't see Him clearly. You don't really hear Him very well, and you know something's not really hitting on all eight cylinders. Now, there's only one thing that can blur your spiritual vision. Somebody tell me, what is that? Sin. That's it. That's the only thing that can blur your spiritual vision. That's sin. Now, there are two kinds of sin that can blur your vision. One is unforgiven sin. One is unconfessed sin. One is a problem for the unbeliever. One is a problem for the believer. So let me tell you what I mean by those two terms. If you're an unbeliever, I don't mean that you don't believe in God. That's not what the Bible defines as an unbeliever. The Bible means by an unbeliever someone who has never trusted Christ as their Lord and their Savior and come to God through Him. And the reason why you cannot have a relationship with God on your own without any help whatsoever is because of unforgiven sin. However, the good news is, is once an unbeliever says, I am trusting Christ, I'm putting all my faith in Him, I'm accepting His payment for my sin, you receive God's forgiveness and you enter into a relationship with God. On the other hand, where an unbeliever can't have a relationship with God because of unforgiven sin, a believer cannot have fellowship with God because of unconfessed sin. So I'm going to ask you a question right now, and I'm going to let you determine where you really are spiritually. It's not a real hard question, and you will know immediately where you are with God. Here's the question. Is there any known, unconfessed sin in my life? 
Is there anything you're doing in secret you wouldn't want your wife to know, your children to know, your husband to know, your, your, your father, your mother? Is there, is there any problem you've got with, with someone else? You've wronged someone in the past. Is there something you're doing on the side and you're trying to keep it secret? Whatever there is, is there any known unconfessed sin in my life? Let me tell you why that's such a big deal if you're a believer. In the book of Psalms, the psalmist wrote this in Psalms 66, 17 through 18. Listen to these words. I cried to him, that is God, with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. The psalmist is talking about a time he was trying to have a conversation with God. He was praying to God. He was praising God. He was worshiping God. He was blessing God. And then he goes on to say this, but if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Now, here's what the psalmist said. You can pray to God all you want to pray to God. You can praise God all you want to praise God. You can converse with God all you want to converse with God. You can talk to God till you're blue in the face. But if there's known unconfessed sin in your life that you are not willing to get rid of, he says, God will not listen. Unconfessed sin will keep you from getting up close and personal with God. Just as there are two types of sin, I've already told you, there's unforgiven sin and there's unconfessed sin. There's two types of unconfessed sin. There's sin that you've not confessed to God, and there's sin that you've not confessed to others. Now, I've already given you the answer to this question, but I'll let you guess it. The only remedy for unconfessed, unforgiven sin is what? Confession. Nothing else solves the problem. Nothing else cures the problem. So if you're here this morning and you've got unresolved, unconfessed sin, either with God or with others, you cannot, you don't have a prayer of getting up close and personal with God until that sin is revolved, resolved. So here's why don't you take out the door with you this morning. Confession, if it's going to be done right, must be up and down and all around. Confession must be up and down and all around. Now, if you brought a copy of God's Word, I want to show you something. I want you to turn to 1 John. It's toward the end of your Bible, not too far from the maps in the back. Two things we're going to talk about very quickly this morning. If you want to be up close and personal with God, you want to hit all eight cylinders with God, you want God in 2020 focus in your life. Number one, we must confess all sin that is against God. Now, before we get into this text specifically, I want to just begin by saying something. All sin ultimately is always against God, always. Even sin that you commit against someone else is first of all a sin against God. And I'll give you an illustration of this. There was a king in the Bible named King David. Many of you may know his story. If you don't, I'm going to pretend that you don't tell it all over again. David was a great king, the greatest king in all the Old Testament. He was also a great criminal. And this is the story of David. They, all the soldiers, all the troops were out in battle except David. For some reason, the commander-in-chief stayed home. Shouldn't have stayed home, but he did. He goes out one evening, and he's on his balcony, and he lived above everybody else in the city. And back in the day, women would go on their rooftops to take a bath. Well, he looks down, and there's this beautiful woman named Bathsheba, and he, uh, she's taking a bath. Immediately, he lusts for her in his heart. He sends a courier down, invites her to the palace. They have a one-night fling, but that one-night fling was an all-day wrong for two reasons. First of all, she was already married to a man by the name of Uriah, wrong number one, and then that was compounded by the fact that she got pregnant. Well, David finds out that she's pregnant, and he brings Uriah home from the battlefield and does everything he can to get Uriah to sleep with his wife, <clears throat> trying to cover up his pregnancy, but Uriah Raphael refuses to do it. He will not sleep with his wife. Well, David knows that this baby bump that's about to show is more than just a little bump in the road. So he sends Uriah back to the battle and has him killed and then takes Bathsheba for his wife. Now, at that point, even though David still had a relationship with God, because once you have a relationship with God, it can never be broken, he was completely out of fellowship with God. And he did what we all are prone to do. He did what we all want to do. He tried to cover it up, tried to conceal it. Well, that doesn't work with God. The Bible says in Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sins will find you out. So God reveals what David had done to a prophet by the name of Nathan, and Nathan confronts David. Now, to David's credit, when Nathan confronted David, immediately 
David comes clean. He's convicted of his sin. He confesses his sin, and, and he asks God for his forgiveness. Well, later on, David wrote about that experience in the 51st Psalm. If you go home this afternoon and read it, that's what David's confession is all about. And in that confession, David makes an incredible statement. Listen to this. He says, this is talking to God. He says, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. He said, whoa, whoa, time out. Isn't murder a sin? Yeah, well, you didn't murder God. Isn't adultery a sin? Well, yeah, well, you didn't commit adultery with God. So what are you doing confessing this sin to God? What David was saying was, you don't understand. Every sin first breaks the heart of God before it breaks the heart of anybody else. And every sin breaks the law and the commandment of God, whether it breaks man's law or not. So everything that we do that wrong is always first and foremost a sin against God, and therefore our first confession must be made to God. Now that raises a question. So how do you confess to God in a proper way to make sure that when you go to God, you get things right with God? Well, that's what we're going to read in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. He says, if, this is John, if we confess our sins, that's our part. He, that is God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, first of all, we're going to take this part, this verse apart, piece by piece. Let's look at the first part. He says, if we confess our sin. Now, why does John say that? Because he knows the first thing we want to do with sin is hide it. So what John is saying is, all right, you want to get rid of your sin problem, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to admit it. You've got to admit there is sin in your life. You've got to admit you've got sin in the first place. And I want to tell you something. That is hard for people to do. As a matter of fact, have you, have you ever thought about how seldom people ever even use the word sin anymore? How many times in the last 20 years have you heard politicians or athletes or celebrities get caught in some kind of a terrible, terrible sin, and they'll say this, I made a mistake. Uh, No. You did not make a mistake. There's a big difference between a sin and a mistake. And you see, you know why people say I made a mistake? You don't really feel guilt over a mistake. I mean, you make a mistake, what do you do? Well, you shrug your shoulders, you say, look, well, everybody makes mistakes. That's true. Mistakes don't bring guilt. Sin brings guilt. That's why a healthy conscience will always experience guilt where an unhealthy conscience won't. You know why? Because a healthy conscience understands the difference between a sin and a mistake. So once you realize there's a sin problem, God says, okay, there's only one remedy for it. You've got to confess that sin. Now let me tell you what the word confess means. Beautiful word in the Greek language. It actually comes from two words, the, words, the word homo, which means the same, and the word logeo, which means to say. So what the word literally means is to say the same thing. So let me tell you how you confess sin to God. You don't go to God and say, God, I messed up, I'm sorry. Or God, I shouldn't have done that, and I'm sorry. That's not what you do. When you confess, you go to God, and here's what you do. I want to say the same thing about my sin I know you're saying right now. I want to call it what you call it. I want to condemn it the way you condemn it. I'm not making any excuses. And you say, well, you know, why is that so hard to do? Can I, can I be honest and tell you why? Because when you confess, what you're really doing is you're testifying against yourself. And nobody wants to do that. And yet God says, now when you mess up, you got to fess up. And if you don't fess up, I'm going to see that you're stressed up. I made that up. Just don't say amen. <laughs> you, you, when you mess up, you got to fess up. You don't mess fess up, I'm going to stress you up. Listen, do you realize how we're conditioned in our society not to do that? Great, great illustration. Fifth Amendment. Remember what it says? No person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. That's, that's a constitutional right. And yet the Bible says spiritually there is no Fifth Amendment. You can't plead the Fifth with God. With God, you've got to say, uh, I know I'm the defendant here, but if you don't mind, I'd go ahead and take the witness stand. Let me just plead guilty because I did it. Or here's another one. How many of you recognize these words? You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you. What is that called? The Miranda warning. Hey, I got news. You can't Miranda God. It doesn't work. You know, you can't go to God and say, well, I'm not saying anything. I'm reading my rights. 
God said, buddy, you don't have any rights. You've got a responsibility, and that is to confess. And you, if you want to get up close and personal with God, you've got to give up the right to remain silent. You've got to confess that sin. And, and by the way, confessing sin, this is nothing we don't understand. Confessing sin and admitting sin are not the same thing. They're two totally different things. You can admit sin without confessing sin. One of my favorite authors is a guy named Kent Crockett. And he tells this classic story about how his two-year-old son, Scott, was sitting on the floor just bawling his eyes out. So he went to the room to investigate, and he noticed laying on the floor beside his little two-year-old boy was this plastic baseball bat. So he turned to his four-year-old daughter, and he said, uh, Hannah, what happened to Scott? And she said, he hit his head. And he said, on what? She said, the bat. And where was the bat? In my hands. <laughs> Admitting sin is not the same as confessing sin. Confessing sin is when you go to God and you say, I agree with you. What I did was this. It was wrong because of this. It broke your heart. I'm asking forgiveness. I'm coming clean. No excuses. Now, here's the good news. The good news is this. Here's what John said. John did not qualify and say, say, if you confess your sin except for the following. He didn't say that. He said, you can come to God anytime you want to with any sin in your life, and if you will confess that sin, it doesn't matter what that sin is, God will forgive you. He'll put you back into fellowship. He'll get you up close and personal. Listen to the verse again. If we confess our sins, now watch this, that's our part. He, that is God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me tell you something I've learned about God, and I've been a believer for 50 years. Never one time in my relationship with God have I done my part and He failed to do His. Not one time. Every single time, He's got a perfect record. Every time I do my part, God does His part. Now, again, I want you to keep something in mind. If you're a believer today, this is important. You do not have to get forgiveness in order to have a relationship with God. Your relationship's permanent. Because I know some of you sitting there right now and you're saying, wait a minute, I'm a believer? Yes. Haven't all of my sins, past, present, and future already been forgiven? Absolutely. That's why your relationship with God cannot end. All your sins have been forgiven. However, unconfessed sin affects your fellowship with God. So you say, okay, how do I know God will forgive me no matter what I've done? He gives us two reasons. Number one, he says, I'm faithful. He is faithful. Isaiah 55, 7 says this, Let the turnful, sinful turn from his way, and the one who does not know God turn from, his, turn from his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have loving pity on him. Let him turn to our God, for he will surely forgive all his sins. God says, look, it's real simple. I'll make a bargain with you. You confess, I forgive. You do your part, I'll do my part. You confess, I forgive. You confess, I forgive. You confess, I forgive. That sequence is permanent and it never misfires. Now, let me tell you what the word faithful means. The word faithful literally means every time. You don't think that's important? If, if you, when it, ladies, let me ask you a question. How many of you would marry a man who would say to you the following words, I love you with all my heart. And if you will marry me, I will be faithful to you 364 days a year. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I, I, don't, I don't like that bargain. Because faithful never gets a break. Faithful never takes a vacation. Faithful never gets a day off. Some of you former Marines out there, you're right. Always faithful. Here's the great news. When you take your sins to the cross of Jesus Christ, God has to forgive you. He has no choice. Because if God didn't forgive you, He not only would be unfaithful to His Word, He would be unfaithful to His Son. And then He gives another reason. He said, hey, I'm not only faithful, I'm just. In other words, what He said is, look, I just can't write sin off. I just can't pretend it didn't happen. I can't sweep it under the rug. I can't lie by, let bygones be bygones. You know why? I am a holy, righteous God. But... The cross is God's guarantee that every time I mess up, when I fess up, God will forgive me. So, let's get that straight. We've got to confess all sin that is against God. But now watch this. 
You can go to God and do that. And you still won't be up close and personal unless the second thing is true. And that is, we must confess all sin that applies to others. Now, now let me tell you why this is important. I bet you've never thought about this before. Not every sin that is against God is against somebody else. The first four commandments of the Ten Commandments do with our relationship to God. So for, let me give you an example. If I decide one day I'm not going to keep the Sabbath day for whatever the reason, you know, we you know, we know that Sabbath's on Saturday, but, but if I decide I'm just not, I'm just not going to keep, I'm not going to follow God's commandment to keep one day a week just for God and just to rest and just to worship Him, I'm not sinning against you. I'm sinning against Him. If I take God's name in vain, I've not sinned against you. I've sinned against Him. If I worship an idol, I'm not sinning against you. I'm sinning against Him. If I have a graven image in my house, I'm not sinning against you. I'm sinning against Him. Not all sin against God is a sin against somebody else. However, every sin against somebody else is a sin against God. If I hurt you, I hurt Him. I'm not right with you. I'm not right with Him. I do you wrong, I did him wrong. Because every sin ultimately breaks his commandment. That means you can be right with other people and not be right with God. There are people in this, in, there are people, you may be here today, you may be a husband and a wife, you don't believe in Jesus Christ, but you've got a great marriage. You're right with each other, you're not right with God. However, you cannot be right with God if you're not right with other people. And if you're here this morning and you're holding a grudge against someone or you've done something wrong to someone or you hurt someone and you have that in your heart and you've never confessed it to that person, you've never made it right with that person, I'm here to tell you today, you are not up close and personal with God. You are not, you may think you are, you may feel like you're close to God, you may feel like things are a-okay, I'm telling you with God, they're not. And so as we look at one other verse I want to show you very quickly dealing with this horizontal confession. Matter of fact, this will be easy. If you're in 1 John, it's only three books back, back in, in the book of James. In James chapter 5 and verse 16, I want to show you a very interesting verse. As, as important as confession is, this is amazing. Did you know there's only one verse in the New Testament that commands us to confess? Only one. Uh, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Isn't it? Even First John doesn't, conf doesn't command it. He, John just said, if you confess, God will forgive. He didn't say confess. He said, if you do it, this is what will happen. Only one time in the New Testament does the Bible con co command us to confess sin. And guess what? It doesn't command us to confess sin to God. It commands us to confess sin to each other. Listen to this, for James 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That's, that's fascinating. James was dealing with sick people. And James said, you know what? You may be sick. And maybe your sickness is called by, caused by sin in your life. Well, you know what? You can go to God and you confess that sin. But if the problem is not with God alone, if that problem is with somebody else, just going to God alone will get you off the hook. So you can go to God all day long and you, say, you can say, God, I stole from him. God, I hurt her. God, I cheated on her. God, I gossiped about him. God, I hurt her feelings. Please forgive me. And God says, well, I will forgive you, but we won't be right until you make it right with them. Because confession is not just vertical. Confession is horizontal. And if I do not go to the one who's been affected and I don't go to the one who's been offended, healing will not come and God will still not be in focus. So here's how it works. When I sin in my life, and let's say I sin against someone else, when I confess my sin to God, that leads to restoration. That's fellowship. When I confess my sin to others, that leads to reconciliation. And this is important. Restoration with God and reconciliation with others always go together. You, you can't separate the baby. You, 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 can't, you can't cut it in pieces. It's all part and parcel of the same thing. See, there's some of you here this morning. And, 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 and the reason why you're so far from God or you feel like you're so far from God, you can, you've been asking the wrong question. You say, okay, there must be something wrong with me. It's not something. It's someone. It's that spouse that you divorced for an unbiblical reason and you knew you did that wrong. But you've never confessed it to that ex-spouse. It's that son or that daughter that you didn't spend enough time with, you hardly spent any time with and you neglected and you know you did. And you've never confessed that. 
It's that mom and that dad that growing up you dishonored because you didn't obey them and you didn't do what they told you to do and you didn't live the way you know you should have lived before them and you've never even, even bothered to tell your mom and you've never told your dad, you know, I'm sorry for the grief that I caused you. And so you've got someone in your life, and right now, let me tell you what's happening all over this building. God's bringing names to your mind right now. I need to make this right with that person. I need to make that right with that person because things are never all right until they're all right with all. And we've all done things at one time or another we've been deeply ashamed of. So I just want to ask you today, did you, do you really need God to come back into focus? You just, just get in gut level on Man, it's, it's not there, Pastor. I know it. I know it. Now I'm finally getting the picture. So I'm going to ask you to do something, and I want to tell you right up front, I'm not going to lie to you. It's hard. It's hard as heck to do this. It's gut-wrenching to do this. But would you be willing to put your heart under God's microscope and say, God, examine every square inch of my heart. If you find any unconfessed sin in my life, if you'll show it to me, I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what price I have to pay. I don't care what phone call I have to make, what person I have to see, what letter I have to write. I'm going to make it right because, God, I want you and me to be, I mean, completely up close and personal. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's cheating on a test or cheating on your wife. If you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Confessing our sin to God is one thing. It's not like it will take Him by surprise. But confessing a sin against another person can sometimes be far more intimidating. If you're not sure how to approach a difficult conversation with another person, call Touching Lives at 800-413-1131 today. We would like to pray with you. The enemy would love nothing more than to interrupt your relationship with God. And the way he attempts this is through sin. But God knew this was going to be an issue, so he created a solution from the very beginning. His word says that when we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us every time. Learn what it truly means to turn away from sin and stay in constant fellowship with God. Order your copy of the series Up Close and Personal from Touching Lives today at touchinglives.org or call 800-413-1131. The Bible teaches that God's mercies are new every morning. Keeping this in mind is paramount for every believer as we inspire to live as Jesus lived. Sharing this love-filled message is the passion of touching lives. And because of the faithful prayers and financial support of our donors, we are able to continue taking this message around the world.